I'm Diana Falzone, and this is 4 for 4 Science, where we discuss four scintillating science topics in only four minutes. It turns out Photoshop is not such a modern day invention after all. Sorry, Instagram models. James, what is so questionable about this picture of General Grant? Well, yeah, you know, the Civil War is revealing more and more of its secrets. So the Library of Congress has released a load of information about this famous picture of Grant, General Grant at City Point, that basically isn't what it appears to be. It's his head, but it's not much else. Wow. I thought this was a really fascinating find because we think of history as these really just fixed and immutable events, but really, as James said, we're learning a lot more about mm -hmm. even Civil War era. I think this also shows that we don't need so much science to debunk these myths. We can just use an, um, our knowledge of American history to be able to say, oh, this wasn't from this time or this was photoshopped. And I think as well that, you know, you get a sense that like images, like we're, we're having to question them through Instagram and mm -hmm. Adobe and everything else at the moment. But this is something people have been trying to recreate images for a long, long time. And, you know, it was basically as soon as we had the photographic image, people were playing with it. I think it's fascinating. Well, and it also makes us question what else in history might might have been photoshopped and having to re-examine all these other historical photographs and saying was this really what we thought it was because the picture does tell a thousand words but it might not be telling the truth. Mm -hmm. If you're a frequent flyer your ears may be perking up learning there is a jet that could fly across the Atlantic in 30 minutes. Pregnant pause, someday. So Denise how long off is this day? Well, unfortunately, it's probably pretty far off. So this is, uh, it's important to remember that this is just a concept. Mm -hmm. It's not being built yet. It might never be built. But something interesting that I thought um, the inventor, Charles Bombardier, brought up when he was introducing it is that he really just wanted to get people thinking about how to make flying more efficient. And, yeah. and he really just wanted to stoke people's imaginations. And I think he did. So if this could get me back to the UK in time for my tea, I would be so, so happy. I think it's a brilliant idea. The question for me, though, is like, what would it take to make it commercially viable? Yes. Like we saw what happened to Concord. Now, it's going to take something really special to make a jet like this mm. happen. And it's basically it's going to have to be affordable for a lot of people. Yeah. I think going back to Denise's point, this is something that we've been trying to do for the past century since Charles Lindquist tried to cross the Atlantic and then with the Concorde jet. So I don't think this is ever going to be something that we're going to stop trying to do. I think it will happen. We just don't know when. But it also comes down to how green is this idea? Because yeah. when you think about 30 minutes, we're probably going to be using old technologies and not necessarily green technologies. <laughs> so we might fall into a little bit of a, a tailspin with that. Bad weather can be immensely destructive, but bad space weather could downright stop Earth from functioning, according to reports. What is the government doing to protect us Earthlings, James? It's obviously taken this issue very seriously. You know, solar flares, mm -hmm. so for, uh, coronal mass ejections, which cause these big um, clouds of solar plasma, can cause uh, immense problems on Earth. You know, geo geomagnetic storms can mm -hmm. interfere with satellite communications, radar, all manner of things, even power grids. So the government has basically released plans on basically how it wants to deal with a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Better cooperation. Basically, we may be talking to each other in, in basically different types of communication. Schools, different types of governments are going to have to get together to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Claire? I think this is a great way to have less fear over this topic. I think even though we've recorded that it's been happening since the 1800s, we don't really have a good track record for it. We just have random bits here and there. So I think that with less fear over this idea and more knowledge and more studies, mm -hmm. then we'll be able to know a lot more about it. Mm -hmm. The way I like to think of it is if you think about predicting weather on Earth, it's still immensely challenging, especially yeah. if you're thinking about getting really accurate long-term predictions. So the same goes with space weather. I think by having this initiative and putting emphasis on trying to understand more about how the sun's activity affects us on Earth. Yeah, and it also could cost us a pretty penny, something like billions of dollars, even in the trillions, if the space weather adversely affects us. <laughs> a new study says your office is slowly numbing your brain. You're probably nodding our sarcastic yes, but Claire, how real is this really? So the study was pretty small, it was only about 46 people, but it did show that in places that had less carbon dioxide and other pollutants, um, the people actually performed better on cognitive tests, actually 61% better. Hmm. So I think it'll be interesting to see how much better they'll perform with uh, different varying amounts of carbon dioxide. So I think it's a good stepping stone for future research since we spend almost 90% of our time in yes. I think it makes a lot of sense that if there's less chemicals in the air, you're going to perform better. There's more cognitive functions. Obviously, the rarefied air of our own office is perfect. So <laughs> We all, we're all high performers. But yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. I'd like to hear more. 
Yeah, one of the things I think this study really highlights is just thinking about the, uh, the public health implications of the air yeah. that we breathe indoors. I think a lot of people, you know, we talk a lot about carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but we don't really talk about the air quality of the places where we spend a lot of our time. Right, so perhaps we need to not worry about having a yoga room or a masseuse available <laughs> for us to us. Instead, we should be thinking about our air quality in the office space. Now, you know, we think, tell us what you think with the hashtag 444science, and we will see you there.